The crashing of the waves and the howling of the wind all but absorbed the sounds of conversation or even the intermittent screams of the inhabitants of Gilgo Oak Beach, a remote backwoods stretch of wetlands and sandy dunes located off of Ocean Parkway. This entire strip of land is referred to as Jones Beach Island, owned by the nearby town of Babylon, and is an area primarily frequented by tourists in the spring and summer months. But missing amongst the brochures for vacation homes and boat rentals is any sign that upwards of 16 people have been found, brutalized and buried, in the area's beaches and marsh. In the past decade, those who came to the surf of Gilgo Oak Beach in search of serenity and selfies were often unaware that a serial killer had been terrorizing the community for years. And while internet sleuths and the private investigators of families affected searched the rough terrain of the beach and its surrounding areas relentlessly for clues or pertinent artifacts, the picturesque landscape seemed to hold far more questions than answers. That is, until July of 2023, when a break was finally made in the case and new information began to pour in. This is the active and ongoing case of the Long Island serial killer. This video is sponsored by Incogni. Whether we realize it or not, we give our personal information to multiple companies daily. It's always aggravating to receive mail or an email that seems like something important, but turns out just to be an ad. And don't even get me started on the spam calls and text messages that inundate my phone. And I always wonder, how did they even get my data? Data brokers are the problem and Incogni is the answer. Once a data broker has your info, they can sell it to companies and spammers alike. I know with my internet shopping obsession, I'm on more lists than I can count. And yet, I've clicked various unsubscribe buttons thousands of times, yet I continue to get countless emails from places I've never even heard of. And if you're like me and don't have hundreds of hours a day to call millions of 1-800 numbers to delete your data from the internet, then you can get incogni and liberate your personal information. Incogni will masterfully get you off of so many data brokers lists. You'll be amazed and relieved with how few junk mailers, spam calls, and emails you're getting. You may even miss all the attention. Just look how many data brokers already had my information. With a few simple clicks on Incogni, I'm able to delete my personal data from the greedy hands of data brokers so that they can stop selling my information to both scammers and corporations. The first 100 viewers to use the code MYSTERY at the link below will get 60% off of Incogni. Just go to incogni.com slash mystery or click the link in the description below. Thank you so much to Incogni for not only getting my data off the internet, but also for sponsoring this video. The first inkling that a serial killer was on the loose was prompted by the search for 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert a call girl who had disappeared after a panicked 911 phone call in May of 2010. In searching for her body, police were unsuccessful, but shockingly, in December of 2010, investigators instead made the gruesome discovery of four other bodies by the side of Ocean Parkway on Gilgo Oak Beach. It was the harrowing 911 call made just after midnight on May 1st, 2010 that acted as the impetus to comb the area. And although Shannon was not located in the initial search, her brave outcry to police dispatch helped bring multiple victims to the light of day. It all began in the late evening hours of a sweltering summer night, when 23-year-old Shannon Gilbert, an escort, was out on a client visit and made a phone call to her driver, Michael Pock. The call lasted three minutes, in which her driver says Shannon told him she was finished with her current client in Manhattan and needed to be retrieved. This was a common practice of call girls in the city. 
a driver would act as an outside security figure to whom the girls, often newly independent and highly vulnerable, could rely on for safe transportation. In exchange, the drivers would be paid an hourly wage or would get a cut of the girls' fees. While the escorts were the ones who interacted face-to-face -face with the clients, known in the industry as Johns, the drivers were the girls' connections to the outside world, ideally just a call away. At 12.20 a.m., Shannon was contacted by another potential client, presumably through Craigslist, although her driver never specified to police. Michael Pock says that he does not know how the man, later identified as Joseph Brewer, specifically got the sex worker's number, only said to police that another client had called, this time from Long Island, in order to solicit Shannon's services. At 2 a.m., the pair arrived at the gated community of Joseph Brewer, the John who had requested Shannon. Some question why Shannon would accept such a remote call, as it takes a little over 90 minutes to reach the Ocean Parkway from Manhattan, and call girls generally avoided the area. Some speculate that this was for services beyond intimacy, and a slip of the tongue from Shannon's driver revealed that drugs had also been involved. In later police interviews, her driver recalled that Shannon and Joseph left the home at some point during the visit in order to get, quote, more drugs. Later, Shannon's driver recalls being requested inside the John's home as Shannon was supposedly refusing to leave. An unusual turn of events for both the John and the driver. When Michael entered the upscale but messy domicile, so trashed in part due to many nights of partying, he entreated Shannon to leave. This fact is evidenced by a panicked 911 phone call Shannon made, a call which was recorded and finally released to the public more than a decade after the crime. In the 911 call, her driver sounds not angry but confused in his pleas with Shannon to leave the home. The recordings showed that her driver was trying to get Shannon to exit the house and was offering to take her back to New York City. Police did not suspect her driver, as in the recording of the 911 call, he even acknowledged that she was on the phone with authorities and seemed to be fine with it, albeit bewildered. Michael Pock did not sound angry that Shannon had contacted police, nor did he sound aggressive. Although on the 23 minute phone call, you can hear him reminding Shannon that he had his gun on him. It is unknown if the gun was legally acquired or if he had a permit to carry it. So many find it unsurprising that he would want nothing to do with police that night. State police, Trooper Fry. State police. Yeah, there's somebody asking me. I'm sorry? There's somebody asking me. Where are you? There's somebody asking me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody asking me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. You're driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you trace where I am? I'm sorry? Can you trace where I am? No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? Somebody's after me. Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? No. 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 No, stop, no. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? Uh -huh. Why? Why are you calling me by my name? Why? County, you on the line? Stop! Please. Stop it, please! Please stop! <laughs> Please, can you shut the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 Go that way, please. I feel scared. 
Those who believe the police are correct in clearing Shannon's driver rather early in the investigation argue that if there had been any connection to any of the other victims killed, it would have been discovered long ago, and he would have been seen as a suspect due to his proximity to the victim in the recording. The fact that police cleared the driver shows that there was no connections made to any of the other sex workers whose lives were tragically taken. Shannon. After her initial 911 call, between the hours of 4 and 5 in the morning, Gus Coletti, a resident in the gated community in which the John belonged, had already awoken and had begun his strict morning routine. As he was shaving, he heard Shannon screaming from the outside of his home, quote, Help me, help me, they're going to kill me. A consummate gentleman and an inquisitive mind, Gus Coletti opened the door for Shannon and led the panicked girl to a chair before calling the authorities himself. Gus can be heard on the 911 call saying that Shannon looked no older than 14. While on the line with police, Gus is heard urging this young woman to tell him what's wrong, but he recalls that she just stared at him. As he tried to reassure her that authorities were being contacted, he says Shannon ran back off into the night, seemingly alarmed that 911 had been called, although she'd been on the phone herself with dispatchers only moments prior. Somebody at you? Huh? Hello? Hello? Don't get so hurt. Where are you going? Wait a minute. Where are you going? As she ran into the darkness, Gus noticed that a black SUV was stopping in the road randomly as if searching for someone. 
That black SUV was being driven by Michael Pock, who was frantically looking for Shannon after she had run out of Joseph Brewer's home. Moments after seeing the black SUV sporadically stopping in the road, Gus noticed that Shannon was tucked under his boat as if hiding from the SUV. While Shannon was hiding, the driver of the SUV stopped and asked Gus if he had seen Shannon, to which Gus recalls that he replied he had and that authorities had been contacted. Gus says he was disturbed by Michael's response, recalling that the driver had said, quote, you shouldn't have done that. She's going to get in a lot of trouble. However, later, upon the realization that Shannon had been engaging in illegal sex work, those lines would become less ominous and more indicative of the unyielding current political climate surrounding sex workers' rights. It was illegal to be a sex worker in New York City, and while call girls were allowed to advertise their services as being escorts on dates or as maids in homes, they were not allowed to engage in sexual activity. After talking to Shannon's driver, Gus watched as the panicked woman ran off towards the intersection of Sandy Drive, her image dissolving into the darkness of the pre-dawn hours. Michael Pock later claims that he believed Shannon to be angry at him, and therefore he believed that she had decided not to get a ride home with him, and he chose to leave to go back to New York City, neglecting to alert authorities that Shannon was not in his care. While Gus did not see Shannon again, his neighbors did, Barbara Brennan's home being more noticeable than the ones to the right or left is a possible factor as to why Shannon chose to reach out to her specifically. Barbara's house featured a constant lighted vigil, which she has kept in remembrance of her husband. Barbara recalls that when she heard Shannon banging on her door, she was understandably alarmed, and says that instead of opening the door to the unknown stranger, she placed two phone calls. The first call was to police at approximately 5.22 a.m. The second call was to her neighbor, Tom Canning, who came over with his hunting dog. Their actions evidently scared Shannon, who ran back into the shadows and away from the safety of civilization. This would be the last time that Shannon was seen alive. Police, meanwhile, arrived on the scene and searched for Shannon on foot. However, they recall they neglected to search the marshes due to the water level, a fact that later would become contentious. Originally, Suffolk County Police Department's Missing Persons Bureau had asked that Shannon be searched for by a cadaver dog, a German Shepherd named Blue. Over the course of the entire summer of 2010, after the panicked phone call had been placed to police, the area had been frequently searched. However, the dog's handler continued his search and his work paid off on December 11, 2010, although not in the way he was hoping nor expecting. Basing his new search area off of the fact that statistically, FBI data indicates that purposefully abandoned bodies are frequently found close to roadways, the handler of Blue, the cadaver dog, led the dog to a new search area. There, shockingly, Blue was able to uncover, over a period of two days, four bodies that had been dumped in the area. But in a twist unexpected by authorities, none of the female bodies found were Shannon, the original search target. While the heavy vegetation, coupled with a light layer of snow, caused the area to be initially overlooked by previous human searchers, Blue the cadaver dog was able to alert to a scent which handler officer John Malia was able to use to locate skeletal remains. These remains had been placed in a disintegrated burlap bag and were later identified as that of Melissa Bartholomew. This would be the first of four bodies found in the span of 48 hours. Police would ultimately uncover three additional bodies in their investigation of the stretch of Ocean Parkway. These victims would be unearthed from the oppressive conditions of the surf and surrounding marshland. This entire area was a confluence of wind, sun, sand, and stone, which made artifact recovery a difficult task. The victims, Marine Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello were all found within 500 feet, 150 meters, of each other, and would later be dubbed the Gilgo Four. But while the community of Long Island would be rocked by such findings, those would only be the first of many brutalized bodies to come. 
as eventually more than 10 victims would be found in the general vicinity, confirming what police had initially suspected, a serial killer was on the loose. Dominic Barone, who was at the time chief of detectives for Suffolk County Police Department, says that the physical characteristics of the victims, referred to as the Gilgo Four, are significant. The police chief noted similarities in the victim's small stature, petite weight, and hazel eyes, as well as their profession of call girls and their utilization of Craigslist as an advertising platform. The chief goes on to discuss how the killer used sites such as Backdoor and Craigslist in order to search for certain heights, weights, and eye colors of the victims. Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack, victims who were found later in 2011, also fit this Gilgo 4 phenotype. What also connects the victims to a single killer is the presentation of the victim's remains. Most of the bodies were found wrapped or tarped in burlap material. Police have not disclosed how the bodies were specifically displayed, but do indicate that the material burlap was significantly involved in most, if not all, of the victims found in the area. Part of the job description of a call girl, the vocation of all four of the brutalized women found at Gilgo Beach, is to go along with strangers for pay. Such a line of work necessitates certain survival techniques. While many of the victims posted their images and information online on sites such as Craigslist and Backdoor, Ultimately, it was up to the girl whether or not to accept a job and how to take the call. Detectives think that the fact two of the Gilgo Four willingly left their phones behind indicates a possible level of intimacy with this John, as going to a call without a phone was highly out of the ordinary. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was the first of the four women later found on Gilgo Beach to initially go missing. She was last heard from on July 9th. 2007. In 2007, Maureen had called her friend Sarah to say that she had been robbed of all her cash, but not of her phone. She requested a ride from Sarah, who lived in Connecticut, but her friend was unable to pick her up. This would be the last time that anyone heard from Maureen. Maureen brought her phone to the job that would be her last. Later, it is speculated that the killer may have gone through Maureen's cell phone contacts in order to get the phone number of Sarah, Maureen's friend from Connecticut. A man contacted Sarah from an unfamiliar number that may have been from a burner phone. The caller did not specify how he had gotten Sarah's number, but commented on the fact that her phone number had a Connecticut area code and said that he had recently interacted with a young woman who was also from that area. He claimed that he had recently seen Maureen alive, and that she was currently at a, quote, whorehouse in Queens. The cold and emotionless voice would not give his name, nor did he give a specific location. The caller also claimed that he would call back and give Sarah the precise address. However, he never called again. In the ensuing year, the NYPD had reported no trace of Maureen nor pings from her phone, but then, in 2008, Maureen's phone made contact with a Long Island cell tower on Fire Island, a couple of miles from where Maureen would eventually be found. Forensic investigators say that the 2008 ping was a result of the phone being powered on and used to check the voicemail of Maureen. This accessing of Maureen's voicemail was over one year after Maureen was presumably killed. Therefore, investigators say it must have been the killer to access her voicemail, thus activating the nearest cell tower from an island called Fire Island. The second victim to go missing, chronologically, in the cluster of four found at Gilgo Beach was Melissa Bartholomew. She had worked hard to get her cosmetology license and dreamed of one day opening her own hair salon. She went missing on July 10th, 2009, two years after Maureen disappeared and about one year before Shannon would go missing. As in Maureen's case, the killer utilized the victim's phone to contact a loved one, Melissa's sister, Amanda Bartholomew, who lived in Buffalo, New York. She was contacted by the killer just days after Melissa's disappearance. In a brazen deviation from the last set of harassing calls made to Maureen's friend Sarah, the killer this time utilized Melissa's own cell phone to make the phone call. 
The call seemed to be from her sister, so Amanda quickly answered, only to hear not the voice of her sister, but the voice of her sister's killer. The calls consistently occurred only in the evenings. Inexplicably, the police do not have recordings of the calls, but Amanda, just 16 at the time, remembers them all too well. She recalls that what she heard on the line gave her chills. Is this Melissa's sister? She recalls a man asking in a low voice. Amanda recalls simply replying yes to the man before he asked sinisterly, do you know what your sister is doing? She's a whore. Amanda's mother, Lynn, tried to answer these sadistic calls on one occasion, but when the killer heard her voice, he hung up. Lynn would document the encounters in a journal, which she gave detectives, but no viable leads were released as a result. Though police were informed of the calls, which occurred over a period of weeks, investigators waited far too long to set up any sort of tracing or recording mechanism, and media reports differ in if they were ever successful. It took Melissa's family soliciting help from a family friend in law enforcement in order to get any usable data on the call's originations. The phone company was able to tell the family that the killer's calls had pinged through at least three different towers. Two were New York City, one near Times Square and the other near Madison Square Garden, and one was from the town of Oyster Bay in Nassau County, very close to the last location that Melissa was known to be alive as she had checked her voicemail from that location. Some reports detail that when police finally had the phone hooked up to a tracker, they were foiled by the killer yet again, as he limited his taunts to under three minutes. Due to the technology available at the time, a call that took less than three minutes would be untraceable to police. In August of 2009, after a Buffalo television station irresponsibly reported on the tracing attempts and cell tower ping results, the calls ceased. Police believe the killer to be adamantly following the case through media reports, and such a leak led the man to use more caution and to stop calling. Chronologically, the first two victims of the Gilgo Beach Four had loved ones who were contacted and taunted after the girl's disappearance. The supposed killer called Maureen's friend Sarah from an untraceable line and Amanda, Melissa's sister, from Melissa's own phone. The last two victims of the Gilgo Four, Amber Costello and Megan Waterman, were somehow convinced to leave their phones behind when meeting the John. It is uncommon for call girls to go into someone's house without a connection to the outside world, but these two seemingly willingly went in without their phones. Megan's mother says such actions are not something that her daughter would normally do, as she was very attached to her phone. Some web sleuths dedicated to the cause wonder if the killer had utilized an excuse about a medical condition to keep the girls disconnected from the world. Some postulate if the killer may have suffered from a heart arrhythmia and may have had a pacemaker type of device implanted. He possibly could have used that as an excuse for the girls to not have their cell phones, as technology at this time was thought to interact with implanted heart devices negatively, and patients were told to keep cell phones six inches away from their implanted device and to be wary around different types of powerful technology. Amber's male roommate recalls talking to her before she left to engage in what would be the last call of her life. He says that he tried to encourage her to bring her phone with her. However, she was adamant that the client did not wish her to bring it. However, she did not further elaborate. Those who carry this theory say that whether or not the condition was real or made up, it certainly could explain why the girls chose to leave their cell phones behind. The other victim who was convinced to not bring her phone was Megan Waterman. She would accept jobs at the request of her boyfriend, Akeem Cruz, who called himself Vibe and doubled as her pimp. Vibe would use a laptop to place ads for her services and would accompany her to the Holiday Inn Express in Hopog, New York. She was last seen wearing a yellow shirt on CCTV footage in the lobby of the hotel room. Before she left the premises, a witness last spotted Megan near a liquor store. This would be the last time that Megan was seen alive. Cops questioned her so-called handler, Vibe, and took possession of his laptop, but police say he is currently not a suspect. 
In March of 2011, just three months after the Google 4 had been located, the dismembered hands, forearms, and skull of a then unidentified female were found along a nearby stretch of Ocean Parkway. These remains were eventually DNA matched to a torso in Manorville, a nearby town in Suffolk County, back in 2003. These remains were located one mile east of the original dump site. These body parts, separated by time and dump site, would later be identified as that of 20-year-old Jessica Taylor. Then, on April 4th, 2011, another skull, a pair of hands, and a right foot were found in a plastic bag near Ocean Parkway on Gilgo Beach. These remains would be designated as Jane Doe No. 6 until being linked by DNA to the Manorville Jane Doe. Similarly to the torso discovered in 2003, another female torso had been discovered in November of 2000. The torso of a woman was found by hikers in the Long Island Pine Barrens in Manorville. It had been wrapped in plastic garbage bags and unceremoniously dumped in the woods near Halsey Manor Road. For many years, the identity of the owner of the torso was unknown. But almost a decade later, in 2020, police announced that they had positively identified the Manorville Jane Doe as Valerie Mack, 24, born July 2, 1976. The same day, April 4th, that the second female torso was found, police discovered two additional sets of skeletal remains, an unidentified female toddler, Baby Doe, and an unidentified Asian male who was small in stature and was reportedly donning female clothing. Police speculated that this unnamed male may have been mistaken for a woman by his killer. While adult females were dismembered, the lack of mutilation of the toddler and of the Asian male shows that there may have been an underlying sexual aspect to the mutilations, but not to the killings themselves. Perhaps the killings were done in order to get the victims to their preferred state. Police wondered if, for the killer, it was more about the destination than the journey. Detectives say that the dismemberment occurred in a particular manner, of which the police have not released more details. Then, on April 11, 2011, in what was becoming a sad and shocking pattern of death and mutilation, two more bodies were found in Nassau County. The first piece of remains found that day was the skull of an unidentified woman. True to the patterns beginning to emerge, the woman's dismembered legs had previously been discovered on Fire Island back in 1996. These remains would be referred to as Fire Island Doe. Police would eventually make the connection that this very island was the same island from which Gilgo 4 victim Marine Brainerd Barnes' phone had last pinged. A gruesome geographic perimeter of attack was emerging. Just as in the first body found that morning, a portion of the remains of the second body found that day had also been previously uncovered, this time by a hiker on a beautifully deceptive spring day in 1997. The hiker accidentally stumbled upon an unidentified woman's dismembered torso wrapped inside a plastic bag and put in a Rubbermaid container. Seemingly of African-American descent, the torso was found in Hempstead Lake Park, New York. This victim bore a distinctive tattoo of peaches arranged in a heart shape, thus she was nicknamed Peaches by investigating officers. These remains were later identified as the body of the mother of the unidentified toddler, whose remains had been located in Suffolk County a few weeks prior, and who police had been referring to as Baby Doe. On November 29, 2011, police announced that they believed one person to be responsible for all 10 murders. They commented further that they believed the perpetrator was almost certainly a local from Long Island. Police disclosed that, although cause of death was unable to be determined, the single killer theory stemmed from common characteristics of the victims, and they noted many similarities between the individual treatment of the bodies and the condition of the remains. Later, police would announce a $25,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in the Long Island murders, but to no avail. In December of 2011, Shannon Gilbert, 
the impetus to the original unearthing of countless remains, was finally found, deceased, in Oak Beach, 19 months after her mysterious disappearance. Perplexing to both the public and the police, her purse and some of her clothes were found nearly half a mile from where her body was located. Police, in what many believe is an illogical theory, state that Shannon must have been panicked and cold and most likely had undressed herself before accidentally drowning. The true cause of her death is still contested, as state medical examiners claimed her death to be accidental, yet her family believes otherwise, and refused to bury her. Their tenacity in uncovering the truth led to a legal battle, which caused Shannon's remains to lay in the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office for four years, until she could be re-examined by another forensic scientist. A private and unbiased autopsy report states that Shannon's hyoid bone, a U-shaped bone in the throat area, was shattered, indicating a manual strangulation, as the hyoid bone is not able to be broken from natural forces. Shannon's hyoid bone was missing its so-called horns, the horned-shaped tips that make up the U-shape of the free-floating bone. Shannon's bones had been boiled so that state forensic anthropologists would be able to examine them. However, this caused the bones to be devoid of soft tissue, and by the time the independent medical examiner could investigate her body, there was no way to verify the possible presence of ligature marks, which would be leftover forensic artifacts of a manual strangulation. According to the FBI, manual strangulation is statistically the most common method of silencing women who are victims of a homicide. Another discrepancy in the condition of Shannon's remains as it relates to cause of death is the position in which Shannon was discovered. Shannon was found face up in the marshy area of Oak Park. However, normally drowning victims are found face down as that is where the weight is distributed when the victims are allowed to free float the stomach and the chest and the face go into the water because that is where the weight is distributed. Some critics of the one killer theory point to the variety of the disposal of the victim's bodies as a reason that more than one man may be involved. This is because some of the victims were found dismembered and others were found completely intact. Some were found wrapped with various substances such as plastic, burlap, or rubbermaid Tupperware while others were simply left to nature. Those who disagreed with the single killer theory used this as evidence that separate killers may have been responsible. However, when it comes to serial killers, there is a common myth of consistency. While the behaviors, the vices, or the morality mind games they play on themselves may be the same, the manner in which they choose to enact these fantasies can vary based on time, location, or intended victim, amongst other mitigating factors. Strangely enough, while mutilation was a factor in many of the female cases, the Asian male, who was dressed as a woman and possibly transgender, along with the baby, was not mutilated in any way. This could hint at a possible motivation for the mutilation that far exceeds simply that of killing Police wondered if taking away the victim's identity was part of the killer's goal. In separating their bodies, he made it much harder for police in the late 90s and early 2000s to piece together the various homicides. This concern with keeping his victims nameless could be seen as an element of a power play in the killer's mind. FBI profilers have speculated that the killer may derive power knowing that the family and friends of those lost may never get closure. This power could deepen the thrill of the kill. The phone calls made by the killer continue a pattern of sadism, thus extending the suffering of the loved ones of those he killed. Some speculate that the killer is also responsible for the brutal murders of four sex workers who were found in a ditch behind the Golden Key Motel in West Atlantic City on November 20th, 2006. These four female bodies were found one year before the Gilgo Four began to go missing. The similarities are stark, and a New York Post article was able to quote a law enforcement agent, who refused to be named, as saying, quote, It's the same guy, 
in regards to the similarities of the four prostitutes found dead in 2006 when compared to the four who began to go missing in 2007. Those closest to the case are frustrated by the lack of progress and cite the old adage, too many cooks in the kitchen, as one of the main impediments to success in finding a suspect. In addition to the local police departments that were investigating, the case was being looked into by New York State Police, Nassau County Police, Suffolk County Police, and New York City Police, as the call girls had originated in Manhattan. Later, the FBI would offer their assistance, but would be denied with hostility, as, in a strange turn of events, the man tasked with finding the killer was now at the center of an investigation of his own shocking crimes. Amidst the chaos of having a potential serial killer on the loose, Long Island area cops were questioning the recent appointment of James Burke as police chief of Suffolk County, the only four-star ranking officer on the force and a highly respected position. This position should have come with an equal level of responsibility. However, that was a trait not exhibited by Burke, who was known to have dabbled in drugs and prostitution from the onset of adulthood. According to the New York Times, prior to becoming the highest paid on the force as Suffolk County Police Chief, Burke had been found to have copulated with a sex worker who was known to be a heavy drug user. Early on in his career in law enforcement, Burke was found to be having a relationship with a prostitute who ended up stealing his service revolver. Burke had also previously confessed to having driven drunk numerous occasions while on the job. Ultimately, what finally got him arrested was when a low-level criminal broke into the police chief's SUV and in doing so unearthed the bag of intimate toys. In finding the robber, the police chief made the choice to physically torture the man for his misdeeds, which led to the chief's public sexual humiliation. Many cite Burke's numerous circumventions of the law as being related to Burke's professional and personal friendships with charged criminal and former district attorney Thomas Spada, in whose office Burke had previously worked. One call girl later told Internal Affairs that she had been intimate with Burke at an Oak Beach sex party, which was coincidentally located just over two miles from the location of the later serial killer victim's bodies. Legislator and former cop Rob Trotta told the media in regards to Burke and his touting of the law, order, and common decency, quote, he was a psychopath. Finally, in November of 2016, the now former police chief James Burke was sentenced to 46 months in federal prison for assault and conspiracy. While the investigation into his own personal life had been underway, Police Chief Burke had rejected any FBI offers of involvement on the serial killer case due to his own negative perceptions of the agents. So while the FBI had previously assisted in the search and profiling, they had failed to become officially a part of the investigation, and thus, many resources went unutilized in the initial years of the case. But with Burke no longer in charge of the case, the FBI was invited to assist. In December of 2015, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Tim Sinai announced that the FBI had finally joined the investigation. The FBI had supplied a personality profile for the probable killer back in 2011, which detailed the likely psychological map of the killer's life. The FBI surmised that the suspect was somewhere between his late 20s and mid 40s, that he was a white Caucasian male who likely had a girlfriend or was married, and that he was well-educated, working a stable job. The FBI noted that it was possible that the man had been to the hospital for poison ivy treatment in the past, as he undoubtedly came in contact with the vine during his many travels in the Gilgo Beach brush. This was surmised as investigators had to contend not only with the variable weather, but also the heavy bush of the geography of the area, which was filled with poison ivy. During the search for more victims, some rescue workers later required prednisone treatments from the prolonged exposure to the poison ivy. The FBI profilers also cited that this suspect may have access to burlap sacks. Separately, the FBI posted on their Facebook page that they were seeking relatives and friends of a man named Elijah Lige Howell, or Howard, who lived from 1927 until 1963. 
Mr. Howard previously lived in Pritchard, Alabama, and was married to a woman named Carrie. Investigators state that relatives of this man may be able to assist finding the identities of Peaches and her child. The Post also asked if viewers recognized the peach tattoo on the body of the deceased mother. Strangely enough, in July of 2016, Mari Gilbert, Shannon Gilbert's mother, who was a constant presence in the inquiry into her daughter's death, was fatally stabbed by her younger daughter, 27-year-old Sarah Gilbert, who had been in and out of psychiatric hospitals since 2014. It was reported that Shannon's sister had drowned a puppy prior to taking her own mother's life. The family attorney says that she suffered auditory and visual hallucinations a few years prior to the fatal stabbing. It is unclear if this mental health issue is hereditary or environmental in its origin, but it does potentially shed some new perspective on Shannon Gilbert's 911 call and frantic cries of impending doom. Some wonder, with this new information, if the 911 call does not show a woman in danger at all, but someone in the thralls of their own mental health crisis, possibly hallucinating as her sister had started to years prior. If Shannon was falsely perceiving danger, then her initial 911 call would prove to be more of a red herring, as that would suppose that she was not actually in danger until she left the confines of the homes and the gated community and made her way into the dark marshes of the area. Such movement was reported by a neighbor who saw her walk off in the direction of the wetlands. If Shannon was not actually in danger and was instead having a mental health crisis, then her death may have been unrelated to the initial 911 phone call. Some wonder if Shannon's initial cry for help was simply an unfortunate coincidence, which later led her face to face with her killer. Investigators still say that the Gilbert case is unrelated to the other bodies, but those close to the case take umbrage with such assertions, as they say her body being found in such close proximity to the other victims shows a clear link. In February of 2022, authorities put together a special team known as the Gilgo Beach Homicide Task Force. Comprised of investigators from the local, state, and federal levels, this task force embarked on a focused investigation into the cell phone records of the many victims during their final days. The call records showed that during the days leading up to their going missing, the women had received calls from two main locations, Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa Park. The team got the breakthrough they needed when they were finally able to locate a Chevrolet Avalanche truck, which resembled the one described by Amber Costello's roommate, Dave Schaller. Amber's roommate recounted seeing this very vehicle outside their residence the day before her disappearance. Previously, in September of 2010, Amber's roommate recalled that he had returned home to find Amber seeking refuge in the bathroom while an imposing, quote, Frankenstein-like man threatened her. Her roommate told police that he had engaged in a confrontation with a stranger who eventually departed in a truck. Following this incident, a witness, possibly Schaller or another individual, it is not noted in media reports, reported observing a similar truck pass by the home the following day, shortly after Amber had left to meet a client. Her roommate communicated this information to the police that December of 2010, disclosing details about both the man and his vehicle. Using Schaller's description as a guide and pulling the vehicle's registration history, the task force reportedly honed their focus in to the owner of the Chevy Avalanche, a man named Rex Hewerman. Then, on July 13, 2023, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office announced that they had arrested Rex Hewerman in connection with the Gilgo Beach murders. Rex Hewerman, a prominent New York architect, was indicted by a grand jury on six counts of murder in connection to three of the four deaths of the woman, dubbed the Gilgo Four. Brought up on three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of second-degree murder, Hewerman is alleged to have directly contributed to the deaths of Melissa Bartholomew in 2009, Megan Waterman in 2010, and Amber Costello in that same year. 
He is also the prime suspect in the murder of a fourth woman, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, who was last seen alive in 2007 and is another supposed victim of the so-called Long Island serial killer. In the weeks after his summertime arrest, the media scrambled to learn everything they could about the suspect. Little is publicly known about Rex Huerman, 59, married and a father of two. He is employed at a prestigious New York City design firm in Manhattan, and everyone who knew him says he had them fooled. In 2022, Huerman engaged in a professionally filmed question and answer session with Bonjour Realty, which was posted to YouTube but is now set to private. In the interview, he told the host that he was, quote, born and raised on Long Island. He went on to say that he has worked in Manhattan since 1987. When asked to describe his job, he said, quote, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Rex Yorman, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. Hewerman, now remanded without bail, lived in a quiet neighborhood in Long Island, just a short drive from the location the bodies were found. After his arrest and grand jury indictment, media reports say that he tearfully insisted to his attorney that he is not the killer. Evidence released by police to the media detailed the long and exhaustive investigation that went into Hewerman's arrest. After confirming that Rex Hewerman was the owner of a Chevrolet Avalanche truck, Authorities began to stake out his home in early 2022. The house is situated on the corner of First and Michigan Avenue and is otherwise unremarkable in its presentation. It seems small and run down, which is not in line with the image of wealth and luxury that Hewerman seemed to enjoy presenting. They also monitored his office at 385 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Police were able to legally take a crust of pizza from the architect's garbage can, and from that pizza crust, they were able to create a DNA profile. Taking items from the curbside garbage is a surprisingly common tactic police utilize when suspects refuse to provide DNA or when no sample can be procured without tipping off the target. Investigators say the reason for the delay in the genetic analysis of the hairs found on the victims is due to the fact that the hairs originally found in 2010 were degraded and DNA testing at the time could not yield results. However, improvements in DNA acquisition technology eventually gave investigators the answers they needed. After creating a genetic profile from the discarded food, police compared it to the profile taken from the strand of hair that was left on one of the victims, Megan Waterman. In 2010, during the initial examination of one of the victim's skeletal remains and materials discovered in the grave, the Suffolk County Crime Laboratory recovered a hair from a male on the, quote, bottom of the burlap. Additionally, hair believed to be from Rex Hewerman's wife was found on or near three of the murder victims. Prosecutors allege in the bail application that this is transfer evidence and therefore not indicative of his wife's presence at the crime scene. Evidence shows that Hewerman's wife and children were outside of the state at the times when the three women were killed. At the time Melissa went missing in July of 2009, Hewerman's wife was in Iceland. Similarly, in 2010, she was on a trip to Maryland during the time when Megan Waterman went missing. And in what was a persistent pattern, in September of that same year, his wife traveled to New Jersey around the exact same time that Amber was last seen. The DNA from the hair was matched to Hewerman's wife using 11 different bottles acquired from the inside of a garbage can outside the Hewerman home. The town of Massapequa had long been a focus of the investigation, as an unidentified male reportedly harassed the family of one of the victims, Melissa Bartholomew, following her 2009 disappearance. Records show an unknown male calling and texting the family using Bartholomew's phone. It was not until 2011 that police were able to triangulate the killer's sadistic calls. Using the tracing of cell phone pings, police were able to learn that the cell phone was being used in the vicinity of Manhattan, sometimes made from Times Square and other times near Madison Square Garden. Other calls were made from Massapequa itself. 
Many in the community say they were shocked to learn that the supposed killer was in fact hiding in plain sight throughout the entire investigation. Rex Hewerman was known to be a professional and family man. Hewerman worked in a job which required him to not only engage with high-level clients, but also to network at some of the most exclusive New York events. While the marital and family status of the supposed killer surprised many in the true crime community, the FBI's original profile, created by forensic psychologists, detailed that they thought the killer seemed the type to have a long-term partner. As such, his being married is not completely out of the realm of what law enforcement hypothesized. Visually imposing, Hewerman is described by those who have met him as a large, tall man. One person who interacted with him on a professional level said that he had the characteristics of, quote, an ogre. Reflecting on the suspect's physical attributes, the Suffolk County District Attorney said that he, quote, clearly selected tiny women, people he really wanted to dominate. While executing a search warrant on the father of two's ornate home, a doll was found and taken into police possession. While no public details of the origin of the doll have been disclosed, those close to the case say the item may have been taken from the burial sites of the Gilgo Four. As in years past, many mourners elected to place dolls and other tokens at the initial location the bodies were found. While the doll may be unrelated to the murders and simply a possession of the architects or a family member, some wonder if it may be some sort of trophy. While speculations abound, many in the community hope that more information will be released as to the items uncovered in the suspect's home and the timeline leading to his arrest. Previously, John Bitrolf, a carpenter living in Manorville, was thought to possibly be responsible for the unsolved Long Island cases. He was eventually connected by DNA evidence in the 2014 killings of two street workers, Rita Tongretti and Colleen McNamee. Though he was not specifically connected to the Gilgo Four, nor the other remains on the beach path, some involved in Bitrolf's arrest observed the similarities in both victims' chosen professions, as both sets of victims had been involved in the escort business on Craigslist and other classified websites. Notably, the phrase John Bitrolf had been typed into a Google search bar by Hewerman himself, it is listed as number 14 in an inventory of evidence recovered by digital forensic technicians. Vitrolf's method of killing was to inflict blunt force trauma through his bare fists, as opposed to the strangulation experienced by a majority of the victims on the beach. Police point to additional differences in the criminal's modus operandi, specifically concerning the burial ground chosen for Vitrolf's victims, who were left on the side of the road and not buried on the beach. With merely rumors connecting Bitrolf to the Gilgo Four, he was arrested for the two murders to which police could conclusively link him, and in 2017, he was convicted to 50 years to life in prison. According to the state's response to Hewerman's bail application, an application which was later denied, the since convicted Bitrolf was one of the over 200 search terms catalogued by forensic technicians made in relation to the Gilgo Beach case. Also noted by police to provide context to the killings were thousands of explicit Google searches and queries into nearby escorts. Reportedly, he remained Google searched phrases such as, quote, why did law enforcement fail to trace calls made by the Long Island serial killer? And quote, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been captured? Additionally, searches for, quote, new phone technology as a potential breakthrough in the case were located on his computer. One Google search made by Hewerman was for a gay male of Asian descent, specifically with delicate characteristics, although the terminology he used was far less informal. Detectives saw this as a possible connection, as one of the bodies that was found along Ocean Parkway was an Asian male in female's clothing. The victim has still not been identified, but is described as a young, biological male found wearing items normally attributed to a female. Law enforcement believed the victim had been dead for about five years when he was eventually found in April of 2011. After releasing a composite sketch to the media, police are asking the public for help in identification. 
Those close to the case, who wish to remain unidentified, say that after seeing the thousands of explicit Google search results, that Hewerman's status as the parent of a young daughter is alarming. In August of 2023, the Gilgo Beach Task Force announced that the victim, formerly known as Fire Island Jane Doe, had been identified as 34-year-old Karen Vergata, who was last seen on February 14, 1996. At the press conference announcing the identification, Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney said that the task force uncovered a, quote, DNA profile suitable for genealogical comparison in August of 2022, which ultimately led to the identification of the long unnamed victim. The 34-year-old was an escort at the time of her disappearance, and the Suffolk County District Attorney says that the investigation into her murder continues, but they stress they are not naming Hewerman as a suspect and note that the slaying of the 34-year-old occurred nearly 15 years before the Gilgo Four murders. While he is not yet charged with Shannon Gilbert's murder or the other possible Gilgo Beach murder victims, police have clarified that while it is possible Hewerman might be connected to more bodies, they have yet to conclusively link the others in a way that could lead to more charges. Some wonder if the newly arrested architect could also be responsible for other killings not categorized under the moniker of the Long Island serial killer. Police are investigating any and all leads which connect Hewerman to other additional killings, which were previously attributed to an unknown person given the nickname the Manorville Butcher. Additionally, a string of attacks by an unknown male, dubbed by police as the Eastbound Strangler, may also be connected to Hewerman, as both series of attacks involved the strangulation of young women. Even with the arrest of a suspect, there's the added uncertainty in regards to the possibility that there are multiple killers, which would mean that while Hewerman is in custody, there may still be a serial killer at large in the community. Investigators had previously connected up to eight murders and attributed to what they were calling the Long Island serial killer, but police concede that until further evidence is analyzed, the wake of slain bodies may be the work of two or more separate and independently sadistic individuals. If anyone has any information about the case or those involved, please call 1-800-CALL-FBI or visit www.tips.fbi.gov. Thank you so much to the continued support shown by our patrons. You can support us at patreon.com or look at the other links in the bio below.